Uh, hello everyone, welcome to the 11th talk of CAP stock series. So last time we heard about protein modeling, today uh, we'll be looking when protein modeling goes hand in hand with functional assays. Over to you, Arthur. Thank you, Shailya. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So today in the CAP stocks, this is the second talk in the function theme. And last week we covered protein 3D modeling and how it helped to identify the function. Today, we have several more protein structure models to talk about, going from olfactory receptor, hedgehog protein, tropomyosin, PASZ protein, and myotubularin. But these proteins, sometimes the structural modeling part can enhance into a wonderful story when we go into identifying the functional role using experiment, several experiments, or sometimes there are some wonderful experiments and they have to be pursued further by so doing structural models or solving the structure through computational ways and further develop that study using molecular docking and several such studies. So these proteins are in involved in several processes such as insect sensing, human cell signaling, cardiac functioning or some or also in some disorders and also, one of them is in, involved in a metabolism in a bacteria. So, among several such collaborative efforts, we'll first focus on insect olfactory receptors, where Dr. Srishti Batra, who did her PhD from Professor Shannon Olson's lab in NCBS, uh, who worked on electrophysiological st uh, studies on the olfactory receptors from several insects, and later on, also did structural modeling for this olfactory receptor and how a promiscuous ligand, which is coffee few runners shown over here, how it binds to this receptor. So over to you, Srishti. Thank you so much, Adit, for a kind introduction. I'll share my screen and uh, present uh, my work. Uh, I'll try to be brief and focus mostly on the uh, structural essays. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so today I'll be talking to you about our functional agonist of insect olfactory receptors and share some functional and structural studies which I carried during my PhD at NCBS. Uh, I'm currently affiliated with Cusins Labs. So to give you a brief introduction, I'll start with very basic what is olfaction. Uh, I think we all know how the sense of smell plays, uh, plays a crucial role for insects like moths to find the flower spot for aging, uh, for black bugs to find mate uh, as reported by studies from the campus and who follow the trail of chemical signatures and also humans who use it to identify stale food most commonly. But these are just few examples. Olfaction plays way more important role. I am interested in insect olfactory receptors. One of the reasons being they are highly divergent protein of family. And more importantly, their structural studies have been very limited and it gives, it's a beautiful family of protein. Uh, there are seven transmembrane protein, but with an inverted topology meaning that the N-terminus is intracellular and C-terminus is extracellular. The olfactory receptors works as a complex in which there is one constant ORCO, olfactory core receptor, and then the another one, a variable unit, OR, uh, which is represented as ORX here. And the ligand actually interacts mostly with the variable units and leads to the signaling. Uh, okay. So uh, why uh, I'm so interested in the olfactory receptors? Because how they encode a signal. So they do something with by called combinatorial coding in which one order can actually interact with multiple or several receptors to initiate a response, we, we, uh, both uh, cellular response as well as the behavioral response. And it is very interesting because the structurally all these receptors are very different. So uh, my interest was because I found one uh, during my studies, I was working on a novel uh, volatile ligand uh, which is called coffee furinol, a scientific name to methyl tetrahydro 3 furinol. It is a very nice smell of coffee or caramel. And this ligand actually interacted with a lot of uh, olfactory receptors in my studies. Uh, as also uh, indicated by Albert during the introduction, I carried out extensive um, electrophysiological studies from the antenna and palps of the insects. And I found that this uh, insect olfactory receptors are uh, on the antenna are actually triggered by this compound. So then uh, that happened in multiple insect species. Then I went on and dig deeper into the uh, single cellular, single sensorium recordings from the olfactory receptors in Drosophila. And my study uh, led me to 
one uh, area of OR and ortho complexes which were involved in the detection. This then I further led into to, uh, took it to the an in vivo system where I expressed olfactory receptors in xenopasocytes as well as in cell lines. And when we express them in the uh, in this uh, system, we notice that the generalized OR orco complexes are actually getting uh, you know, activated by the copy furinone. So this uh, brought me down to an interesting structural aspect to look into because. Uh, since uh, they work with a combination, combinatorial coding aspect, if there is a leak-in which is activating multiple uh, kind of receptors, how is it able to do that? So to understand that, I first modeled the structures and carried out the docking studies. Uh, by when, the time when I was doing this study, the structures of only the ORCO was available, not the variable unit or OR. So I modeled my structures on the ORCO. Uh, so the very first step was to have predict these seven transmembranes because these are transmembrane proteins and it's very crucial to get the structure right. So I predicted uh, uh, seven transmembranes in multiple OAs. I chose a list of uh, generalized receptors as well as specialized receptors. Over here, I'm showing you only results for one generalized receptor. Uh, then I carried out the alignment with the ORCO structure, which was known at that time. And then we modeled it uh, using the homology-based modeling. So um, yeah, the model is based on the cryo-EM structure of the ORCO and we carried out validations using the Ramachandran plots and the Z's course. Then my next step was to go into the docking studies to see how the ligand is interacting with the olfactory receptors. Uh, one common thing which I noticed across uh, the receptors, uh, the generalized receptors was that it is binding in the extracellular loop too. And other studies have also reported similar cases in other receptors as well and other ligand binding. Another important thing was this, residue of YFP, which you see in the uh, uh, ligand interaction diagrams, which are coming uh, residues number 173, 174, and 175, they were constantly coming up in uh, a lot of docking studies. Uh, this was happening along with copypurinone as well as the known ligand ethylbutyrate, which is on the right-hand side. So then I went a little deeper into understanding what is the extracellular loop doing and what are these residues doing. And I found that the proline actually is a very well conserved residue across uh, the olfactory receptors in Drosophila, which I was studying, which my focus was. And it also in the OR22A, which I've shown the studies on and other generalized receptors, which were actually responding to the copy purinone. So that was something quite interesting, which came out during the study that the loop is a vital uh, uh, area for the ligand interaction. And we see that along, uh, not only with this molecule, but with known ligands as well. So to summarize this part, uh, my structural studies got linked with the functional aspect, showing that the ligand is actually interacting on the loop side, which is known, uh, which has been reported from other studies as well, and this uh, been able to activate the receptor. Along with, we were seeing the importance of the proline residue coming up. So in the future studies, I really uh, look into that uh, maybe somebody would be carrying out the mutations in this region to look into how this affects the functional aspects. Uh, with this, I would like to end my talk and thank the uh, my TCM members, Shannon, Sudamni, and Deepa. Uh, my collaborator, Christos, in whose lab I did a lot of functional studies, uh, especially Snehal from the CAPS lab because she helped me a lot um, when I was getting started with the modeling aspects and the docking aspects and NCBS and TFR. And the paper has been published now, uh, and this is the link for the paper. Thank you. Thank you, Shishti. So now we move on to our next topic. So we heard from Srishti about the olfactory receptor and the ligand, the promiscuous ligand coffee curanum. Next, we have a story of protein called hedgehog protein, which is uh, which plays crucial roles in the tissue patterning and even activates cell signaling. And how this protein is, uh, it exhibits a, exhibits a hierarchical organization going from nanoscale to visible clusters. So, uh, Professor Saudamini will be talking about this story. Uh, but I would like to point out one interesting fact in this that there were uh, three major collaborators collaborating labs in this along with the CAPS lab. And incidentally, these three are all direct, uh, I mean, these are directors of NCBS. Uh, Professor Elias Shidhar is the current one, whereas Professor Satyajit Mayer and Professor Vijay Raghavan have been past directors of NCBS. 
So I'll now request Vikas to play a recording by Professor Sodamini on this topic. Vikas. Hello, I'm Sodamini. And this particular story on the hedgehog is a fairly old one. And uh, this was initiated and uh, coordinated by one of my colleagues, Professor Satyajit Mayer, back in 2006. And he was interested in the cell surface organization of the protein that is expressed by this gene. And the reason is uh, because also that the protein, if it is constitutively active, then it can give rise to a huge amount of uh, disorders and cancers. That's where the interest came from. And uh, however, this particular protein is vitally involved in the normal cell growth and differentiation and organ development. And uh, whereas there are anterior and posterior sites, uh, in a developing embryo, the hedgehog itself is expressed in the posterior. Uh, however, uh, the beautiful aspect about the hedgehog is that it's able to affect its presence and regulate the expression of other target genes, which are many cell diameters away and also back into the um, anterior part. And therefore, it's able to uh, affect both autocrine and paracrine signaling. And uh, it's involved in the target expression of um, the expression of many target genes. Uh, some of them may be one cell diameter away, like the patched, or uh, three cell diameters away, like the DPP, and so on. And here, um, a few more people came into this uh, project. Why? Because the what we want to observe in a developing embryo can be conveniently seen in the wing imaginal disc uh, of the Drosophila. And therefore, uh, Professor Vijayaraghavan and uh, Professor Sashidara, then in CCMB, were also uh, collaborators in this project. And uh, what uh, was happening is this sort of uh, many cell diameters away and it's uh, signaling uh, is actually felt across cells as well. Uh, because in the case of some cancers, uh, the presence of the hedgehog has been observed in the neighboring cells of cancerous uh, tumor cells, such as uh, blood cell, immune cell, and therefore, uh, its long distance signaling had been uh, the question of great interest. And uh, in, the, in this project, the hypothesis has been uh, that, first of all, the hedgehog in the, in the cell where it is getting produced will, first of all, get auto, auto uh, catalytically, uh, it, is, it is processed. And uh, the end terminal domain alone is the functional part. And that also gets uh, palmitolated at the end terminal end of the domain and uh, added a cholesterol moiety at the C-terminal end of the uh, N-terminal domain so that it can survive in a membrane environment. Uh, and what we had uh, hypothesized was the hedgehog itself forms oligomers and if the oligomeric form of the hedgehog is responsible for its uh, long distance signaling. So for this uh, to be tested out, uh, two people, uh, Neha Vyas and Devanjan Goswami, then students in uh, Satyajit Minasla, were involved in setting up uh, a fluorescent tag, the hedgehog uh, constructs, in, uh, in which um, not only the uh, palmitoylation and cholesterol is retained, in between there is a ring fluorescent protein included. And the idea is uh, inclusion of this GFP can help to uh, interrogate uh, into the, the presence and uh, quantity of hedgehog in living cells and that to a high resolution. And uh, they have been the two objectives. However, this has to be tested using cell imaging. And uh, what we have on the upper panel is how the, um, you know, uh, uh, in the highly expressed forms of the hedgehog in the wing imaginal disc will look like once the fluorescent tag is uh, present. And uh, also, it's one of its target genes, the patch, which was one cell diameter away, could be also followed using two different colors. So the uh, right-hand side the panel on top then will tell the joint presence of the hedgehog shown in green and the patch, which is shown in red. And this is the wild type. And uh, after including the GFP, Neha and Dibanjan in uh, made sure that the uh, functional uh, equivalence is retained. And the protein with the GFP tag is able to perform the same way. And also it's expressed uh, in, um, in, in, in its equal quantities, uh, both the GFP tag, the hedgehog as, well, hedgehog, as well as the regular hedgehog in the uh, big imaginal case. 
and uh, also they made sure using cell imaging that the uh, GFP tag ledger is able to form both uh, uh, visible and nano clusters. All right. Uh, okay. So uh, with this sort of uh, cell uh, cell biology uh, assay and tools available, uh, then our role began, and they asked us whether we are able to model. Uh, the oligomeric form of the hedgehog. And for this, we started out uh, with the sonic hedgehog whose crystal structure was available. And we, then we uh, homology modeled the uh, Drosophila hedgehog. And this was done by Manon Mani in my group, who was a junior research fellow then. And subsequent to modeling, uh, she performed a protein protein docking, where one of the proteins is hedgehog and the other protein is also hedgehog, so that we can begin to appreciate how the dimeric arrangement will look like. And these were days before our objective score, such as PP check, doc score, had been established. That means we were left with 100 poses and we were sometimes staring in front of the computer and saying, this is the north direction, south direction, and so on. So it was not easy to track these sort of docking poses, but one of them we liked. And we liked it because uh, there was a positively charged uh, spartate uh, at one of the protomers. And this was shielded by three negatively charged residues on the other protomer. And this was a time I still remember very vividly that uh, Manonmani, myself, Neha, and Jitu uh, were all uh, sitting in front of the screen and uh, looking at this lysine 132 uh, and also knowing that it is an evolutionally conserved residue plus sitting at the crystallographic interface of the sonic hedgehog, uh, you can see in many of the homologs, either it is a lysine or an arginine, suggesting that the positively charged nature at that particular site is uh, probably important and uh, could be the putative interface region of the dimer. And uh, armed with this sort of information, uh, Jidu and Neha immediately and spontaneously went forward and did some experiments, which is to change this particular lysine, which is there, in the Drosophila hedgehog, so completely different amino acids such as uh, aspartic. And the K132 D mutant, uh, how does it behave? That's a question we had asked using the cell biology assays that have been very carefully established in the presence of the GFP. And you can see that uh, again, you can uh, notice the hedgehog shown in green color is getting expressed in the producing cells, but its effect on the long range and signaling can be felt. Uh, by following the presence of the DPP many cell diameters away, so it's rich in red color. However, what happens to the mutant? That is a big question. And we can see that the mm, short range signaling is retained. So you can see that there are uh, some, uh, some amount of DPP that are produced in the cell diameters that are very close by. But uh, dramatically, the long range signaling has been completely obligated in the K132 D mutant, suggesting that the presence of this, as part, uh, of this particular lysine and the uh, uh, observation of uh, and the formation of uh, uh, vis visible clusters then is important for uh, the hedgehog to form the nano cluster, which it would do in the presence of uh, other molecules such as HSPG, which would be floating uh, around. And they made sure, and they made sure that the uh, mutant as well as the Y type are uh, expressed in enough quantities. In fact, the mutant is uh, uh, expressed in higher quantities even. And therefore, uh, it became clear that the uh, lysine 132 is important. And uh, the long range signaling is perhaps dependent on the oligomer formation that is facilitated by the presence of this residue itself. And uh, the model that we then proposed is that uh, the presence of uh, electrostatic interactions then give rise to visible clusters. However, in the presence of uh, other molecules such as HSPG, which are there, uh, which are there, peperyl sulfate uh, proteoglycan, which are there present on the membrane surface, uh, the hedgehog limited oligomer would then uh, interact with the HSPG so much that it will start to uh, roll along the bed of HSPG as it were, and then begin to pre affect its presence many cell diameters away. And this is possible because then once the um, hedgehog reaches the um, target cell, uh, it is going to uh, uh, disrupt the normal interaction between patched and the smoothened. 
and uh, this itself will give rise to the release of the transcription factor called CI, which will then give rise to the expression of target genes that we had already noticed. And in the absence of the lysine residue, uh, the particular hedgehog is no longer able to form the uh, visible as well as nano clusters, and therefore uh, the long distance signaling gets uh, affected. So this is the story that uh, we had uh, uh, we had uh, we had to present just now, and uh, I hope uh, you have uh, been able to follow this and uh, enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you, Vipas, for playing that, and thanks to Professor Sadavini for narrating this nice story. So we now we heard from Professor Sadavini about the hedgehog protein, and we now move to another interesting story, uh, which will be, uh, which is again a recording from Margaret. Margaret, uh, she did PhD with us in uh, in Professor Sadavini's group, and during her PhD, she worked on <coughs> several aspects of cardiac thin filament modeling as, uh, and also you heard from her in the structure theme where under the protein protein interaction talk she described how to do the energetics calculation for protein protein interaction in coiled coiled proteins now one of the coiled coiled proteins is a tropomyosin protein which is present in this cardiac thin filament assembly and in this the she not only did the structural modeling but also Try to identify how several mutations are involved in disease conditions like cardiomyopathies. So uh, I'll request Vikas to play the recording by Margaret. Hi everyone. I'm going to talk about our efforts on modeling the cardiac tropomyosin system. Tropomyosin is a long length coil coil composed of 284 amino acids. Each coil coil dimer interacts with seven actin molecule thereby having seven quasi repeats. Tropomyosin acts like a rope which is wound around the filamentous actin. Therefore, tropomyosin has flexible region within the coil coil, coil structure that allows it to flexibly move on the actin filament. Using the previously described algorithms that were developed to study coil coils, we identified important hotspots on tropomyosin structure. But tropomyosin do not act alone in the cardiac system. It heavily interacts with multiple protein in the cardiac thin and thick filament. Where the thin filament is composed of actin polymer, tropomyosin and the regulatory troponin complex made of troponin C, I and T. The thick filament is made of myosin where the coil coil tail of myosin is stacked together and the head domain pops out of the filament and interacts with the thin filament. This whole process in the cardiac sarcomere forms the basis of heart muscle contraction and relaxation. In this whole process, tropomyosin plays an important role. It regulates the interaction of myosin and actin. And this is carried out in a three-step regulatory process which is called as the blocked, closed and open state. So in the block state, the tropomyosin sits on the actin, blocking all the myosin binding residues. With increase in calcium, tropomyosin moves out of its block state to an intermediate state called closed, where partially it opens up the myosin binding residues on actin. With further increase in calcium and further increase in the myosin head domain, it moves out to another state called the open state where it opens up all the myosin binding residues on the actin and myosin head domain binds to the actin and completes one power stroke. This shows that tropomyosin is very important in regulating the cardiac system. Multiple genetic studies have shown that a single amino acid mutation on tropomyosin can cause severe heart disease called cardiomyopathies which lead to sudden heart failure. There are two types of cardiomyopathies. One is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and the second is dilated cardiomyopathy. In hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it leads to the intraventricular wall thickening and compression of the left ventricle. In dilated cardiomyopathy, the wall thins leading to a dilation of the left ventricles. 
To understand the role of hotspot residues on tropomyosin, now we wanted to study the cardiac tropomyosin in the thin filament protein complex and investigate its structure, function and pathological relationship of these important regions. In order to investigate the role of these important regions, we need to first build the model protein complex. Here we used an integrative modeling process to accomplish this task where we used data from various structural resources to build the protein complex. In our study, we used data from X-ray, electron microscopy and FRET to model the cardiac thin filament. And this is the model of the thin filament in the blocked and closed state that we built using the different protein structures. Next, we wanted to study the open state. At that point of time, when we built the model, we did not have a clear idea on the open state and no structural data was available for open state. So we investigated the interface between tropomyosin and actin by sliding the tropomyosin on the actin using a rotational matrix and calculated the interface energy using coil check plus, which we developed to study the coil coil structure. Based on the interface energy, we defined a zone which could be a probable open state. So earlier I mentioned that tropomyosin has seven quasi repeats, each interacting with an actin monomer. Here we studied five quasi repeats in detail from second to sixth. We did not use the first and seventh because they overlap with adjacent tropomyosin molecule and have a complex interaction pattern. Based on the second to sixth quasi repeats, we identified the interacting residues on tropomyosin and actin at different states and made a prediction of the open state interface residue. At this stage, we used sequence conservation pattern of tropomyosin to identify the interface residue. So, so far, we have used wild type tropomyosin to study the interface and identify important uh, residues. Next, we wanted to overlay the genetic mutation data on the structure to refine our understanding of these hotspots. Based on the list of mutation data that we had at that point of time, we saw a trend of HCM mutation clustered near the fifth quasi repeat and many of these mutations were charged in nature and had a strong role on interacting with other proteins. Based on the knowledge of the interface interaction and the predicted hotspot on tropomyosin, we came up with an in silico hypothesis and identified a point mutation that could mimic HCM-like phenotype. The mutation is E181K, which is present in the fifth quasi repeat of tropomyosin. The idea was that we wanted to test E181K along with known HCM and DCM mutations to see if E181K was close to HCM phenotype and similar to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy point mutation. So next we went forward with that. We tested our hypothesis on the bench in Dr. John Mercer's lab at INSTEM. This work was done in collaboration with Professor Jim Spudich from Stanford University. This is E181K and we studied this E181K which is bioinformatically predicted mutation along with known genetic mutations. We chose to study how the HCM uh, and DCM mutations. The HCM ones are colored in red and the DCM ones are colored in blue. And this is the structural organization of the mutations that were included in the study. Here we studied three main regulatory effects of tropomyosin. First is the actin binding property. So we saw a clear difference uh, in the mutant tropomyosin and actin binding compared to the wild type where a significant difference was observed in the dissociation constant between them. 
The second assay that we tested is the ATPase activity. Here you could see E181K clustering with the other HCM mutants, where we see an increased ATPase activity of this mutant when compared to the wild type. A similar trend was seen in the third assay uh, where we tested the calcium sensitivity. E181K with the other HCM mutant increases the calcium sensitivity too. Overall, E181K at a similar phenotype has as that of the HCM in both ATPase activity and calcium sensitivity and had a clear was clearly different from the wild type and other DCM mutations. Through this study, we show that the knowledge gained through structural modeling, protein-protein interface, interaction analysis, and study of conserved amino acids led to a hypothesis using the bioinformatic tools, and we also successfully tested this hypothesis using wet lab techniques. Thank you, Vikas, for playing the recording, and thanks to Margaret for nicely narrating this story. We now have Margaret as well as Neha in the panelists. So please post your questions in the Q&A box and they will be addressed accordingly. So now we'll move to, uh, we heard from Margaret about integrative modeling. So it's like a top-down approach for protein structure. We'll now hear for a, uh, from Nitish on another aspect, which is bottom to up approach where you go start from a computational model and explore all different kinds of ways to elucidate the protein structure. So the protein in focus is a ring opening enzyme involved in phenylacetate degradation pathway. And specifically, the metabolite channeling in this protein uh, has a very interesting story, which Nitish, who is a PhD student in CAPS lab, will talk about it now. Over to you, Nitish. OK, thanks, Advait. Uh, so uh, this enzyme is from bacteria. Many bacteria have this enzyme. Uh, and primarily, uh, this pathway is used to sort of degrade uh, ring structures. Uh, there are many several pathways to uh, degrade ring structure. But when oxygen is, in, is not available in plenty, when the microbe is undergoing facultative aerobic condition, uh, that's when the microbe switches to this pathway because in this only one molecule of oxygen is used as compared to other mechanisms where two molecules of oxygen is used. So that's why this pathway is pretty important. Now the enzyme of our interest is uh, the third enzyme or second and the third enzyme here, which is called PAAZ. It has two domains. One is a hydratase domain and second is a dehydrogenase domain. So what happens is you take a, a ring molecule here and in the first reaction you actually hide, you add water to this partially uh, charged group here once you add the water the molecule becomes partially unstable and then the second domain which is aldehyde dehydrogenase domain further reduces this molecule to a more stable intermediate so now this third intermediate is very very unstable People have shown that if you actually disable or mutate this domain and provide an active single subunit domain, the molecule, the pathway cannot continue. So let me just take a step back and explain what a substrate channeling is. Now, I know it's post lunch, so I'll take an example of samosas. Now let's think that all of us were in this room and then we're passing around samosas. Now, as long as it's going from one hand to the other, the samosa is safe. When you leave the samosa on the table, there may be people, not like me, but there may be people who will come and snatch the samosa away. Now, that's exactly what happens in an enzyme mechanism where the substrate is taken from one domain directly to the other domain without getting exposed into the cytoplasm or that microenvironment. If that an unstable substrate gets exposed to that microenvironment, it can then lead to other reactions. And in this case, this unstable intermediate can then become a dead end product, which is actually toxic to the cell. People had already shown this, that this enzyme and this enzyme complex and this molecule was undergoing substrate channeling. 
Now, our intention was to understand the more structural basis of how the substrate channeling was happening. Uh, so, of course, we started with computational modeling. Uh, our first aim was to actually understand. So, there are two domains. You have a, a hydrogenase domain and you have a de, uh, de, aldehyde dehydrogenase domain. So the idea was to see how are these two domains interacting. Now, because there was lack, and we of course did computational modeling, looked at protein-protein interaction, and also predicted a, 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 a model using protein-protein interaction. And then when we went to validate the model by actually looking at hotspot residues in the interface, uh, the model that we predicted was not correct, which means the mutation did not lead to any significant uh, changes in the structure. So this was because there was limited information available on the interface of these two complexes. There was actually no other uh, structure that was available where these two domains were actually interacting in this way. So naturally, we then went and looked at uh, using crystallization as a way to understand the structure. Because the complex was pretty big. We never successfully got a crystal that was of diffraction quality. So finally, we actually went to uh, doing cryo-EM. Uh, we got the structure using cryo-EM, and this is the structure that you're looking at. Uh, I'll start with this D image here. What you're seeing in blue is the aldehyde dehydrogenase domain, and what you're seeing at the bottom here is the hydratase domain. And these domains are actually swapped, which means the subunit of A interacts with subunit of B. Uh, so it's a swap domain. And these two dimers actually form a very complex structure to give you a hexamer. And the whole complex is actually held at this interface of all the hydratase domain coming together. Now, from a substrate channeling or a substrate tunneling aspect, Nearly 90% of all enzymes are known to have one mechanism of substrate channeling, which is they have what is called as tunnels. When you have a tunnel, which is a hydrophobic tunnel, the intermediate from reaction or domain A can pass through this uh, hydrophobic tunnel and get exposed to the second active site and then leave the enzyme complex. When we looked at the structure, while we were excited to get the structure, but we still we're nowhere close to answering the question of substrate channeling because this structure did not have any tunnels or channels. Now, so that hypothesis of channels were out of the question. Now, next, we wanted to see if these domains are actually going a transition or having movements to bring the two active sites closer. So this is how it is. The question was, are these two active sites coming closer and moving apart to then channel the substrate from one domain to the other? Uh, for this, we used a combination of uh, uh, simulation. But again, because the complex was big, we couldn't do a simulation as it is. So we used the small angle X-ray scattering uh, data to actually constrain the simulation uh, runs. At the end of this uh, simulation, we realized that uh, the complex was actually not going undergoing a lot of movement. It was pretty stable in nature, and both domains were still far apart, which means they were still about 50 angstroms apart. So first hypothesis of channels were out of the question. Second hypothesis of are they coming closer together? They were not happening because they were still about 50 angstroms away. So that's when we uh, wanted to look at, uh, the third option was now to look at electrostatic uh, ways of how the substrate is channeled from one way to other. Because if I go back here, if you see there is actually a phosphate group. Uh, it's actually a, 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 it's a charged molecule. So the question was, is this charged molecule then interacting with the opposite charge molecule within the protein and then leading to a anchoring of this substrate from domain one to domain two. So for this, what we did is that we went back to informatics and looked at uh, sequences, because if you take, for example, E. coli species, in E. coli, you have a combination where the fused domain is also there, 
and you also have uh, other gene which also carry the individual domains as well so you have you have a fused domain gene which is doing this function and you have a separate aldehyde dehydrogenase or hydratase for that matter that are separate genes that are doing some other function what we wanted to understand is if you take all of these fused and unfused individual domains are there certain evolutionarily conserved residues that are leading to this kind of a charged mechanism we did find about four uh, positively charged residues uh, uh, the lysine here and then about four positively charged residues that were actually conserved only in the fused domain but were not conserved in the in few uh, on the individual domains we then did what we did is that we went and then mutated these residues to an alanine and then we used a cell assay what we did is that we would grow the cells on phenyl acetate which is a, as the sole carbon source we had knocked off the wild type gene that was carrying paaz which means whatever gene that you're incorporating now is the only gene that can do this mechanism and since it's the only carbon source if this gene is not working fine then you would find differences in the growth of the buck you do see that as compared to wild type any other form of mutation that we did indeed made the protein or indeed made the bug less uh, actually the bug grew slower which means there were dead end products or toxic products that were getting accumulated in the cell so by this way we were able to finally make a hypothesis that the substrate from domain 1 is then anchored through a set of charged residues and is delivered to domain 2 and then the stable by end product then goes out out of the reaction mechanism so that was the whole story about how we established the mechanism of substrate channeling in pa thank you thank you nitish um, so we i'll just share my screen yeah so we heard about substrate channeling in this uh, interesting story of paz so next we have dr tina bhattacharya who will be talking about uh, a tyrosine phosphatase so we last heard tina in the sequence theme where she talked about evolution of tyrosine phosphatases and uh, among them there is this one particular tyrosine phosphatase called as myotubularin so which has uh, for which tina studied mutations present in its catalytic domain as well as the associated domain and then also pursued the docking of small molecules uh, the, onto this domain uh, the catalytic domain as well as the associated domain the gram domain and also pursued the functional assays for that so we'll hear more from more about it from tina i request tina to join uh, and present her screen thanks abhijit for the introduction uh, i'm glad that i can join this time in person and i hope the screen is visible yes thank you so much okay so i'll go ahead and as you mentioned so myotubulin is the protein that we were uh, we got interested in after we had performed uh, sequence analysis on tyrosine phosphatases so this is also a phosphatase and it's mutated in this muscular disorder which uh, is abbreviated as xlmtm it's a it's a handful of a name but it basically means x linked myotubular myopathy and uh, this is characterized by a uh, large and central nuclei like you can see in these muscle biopsies over here this is a normal uh, cross -sec cross section of a normal muscle where you see the nuclei are peripheral and the muscle cells are also not uh, very roundish whereas in the case of xlmtm affected muscles you see very large centralized nuclei and this not only affects uh, so it has it correlates very poorly with uh, survival among infants so it primarily affects infants and it is a congenital disorder and it is also x linked meaning it uh, affects mostly male infants and there's only a survival of 50% of the affected males at uh, with, like most of them would uh, would die in the first 18 months of their life either due to respiratory failure or other complications that are related to skeletal muscle 
muscle dysfunction. And uh, if they survive, they require up to 24 hours of uh, ventilation and constant medical support. So we looked into the literature on XLMTM disease and also public databases. And we had a list of about 150 mutations. And we filtered these using different bioinformatics predictions and also to select representatives from the different domains of the uh, multivalent protein. And we finally had 13 mutations from all over the sequence of MTM1. So this is the lipid binding gram domain. And this PTP or phosphatase domain in uh, green is the catalytic domain. And it acts on lipid phosphoinositides. And there's also a coiled coil domain. We heard a little bit about coil coil domains from Margaret in, uh, in today's talk. And uh, these three domains had mutations all over them, although there were quite a good number of these mutations that we had curated mapping to the catalytic region. And we included a negative control, which is a catalytic dead mutant, where you have the catalytic cysteine residue mutated to make it phosphatase dead. Now, in absence of a crystal structure of MTM1, we modeled the region corresponding to the gram and phosphatase domain using a closed homologue for which the crystal structure was available. And these are the mutations mapped onto the crystal mapped onto the model structure. And uh, this was slightly before alpha fold two had alpha fold and alpha fold two had come into the picture, but we also compared our models and we found them to be very much agreeable with those models predicted by alpha fold. We also modeled the coiled coil region a bit differently. Uh, so similar to what uh, Margaret would have uh, discussed before. And this was modeled using tropomyosin. And you can see that the sole mutant from coiled coil domain maps to the dimeric interface. So I must mention that the, sorry, I, I, sh I should mention that the coiled coil domain is important for dimerization which enhances the lipid phosphatase activity of these proteins. Now we docked the ligand, which is the phosphonicotide lipid to both the gram domain and also the phosphatase domain. But in interest of time, I'll only show you results of the docking results from the phosphatase domain. And on the y-axis, although it's shown in negative values, wild type, you can see that it is most stable in terms of binding free energy of the complex between the MTM1 protein and the lipid substrate, while all the other mutants are heavily destabilized. And the other interesting aspect of it was that these mutants, they have interactions with the lipid group shown in red over here, sorry, the phosphate group shown in red in this table, that should actually be removed. So that is not interacting with the wild type residues, but it starts interacting with residues in the mutants. And there are also key residues that, uh, that do not have any interaction with the lipid. And these are shown in gray over here. Uh, this is the wild type complex compared to the other mutants. And we also performed molecular dynamic simulations. And we saw that these sort of loss of conserved interactions and gain of interactions with the hydrolyzable phosphate group, which might not be very favorable. These are also maintained over the course of the simulation trajectories. So we went ahead and selected a few mutants which were quite destabilizing in terms of the structural studies and performed a LC-MS-MS or tandem mass spectrometry based sensitive lipid phosphatase assay. This had been developed in uh, Professor Raghu Padinyat's lab, and uh, this was in collaboration with his lab. So we transfected HEC 293 T cells with flag tagged MTM1 constructs of the wild type and the mutant proteins. And we used these lysates, the cell lysates, as the enzyme source to carry out a lipid phosphatase, sorry, excuse me, a lipid phosphatase assay, which was detected using a, a tandem mass spectrometer. And we saw that compared to the wild type, which is shown over here, the mutants, including the ones from domains that are not 
uh, mutants that are not in the catalytic domain. So you have R69S over here, which is from the lipid binding domain and one from the dimerization coiled coil domain as well. So these do not have any phosphatase activity. And also most of the other mutants express very poorly when compared to the wild type. And these were not taken up for phosphatase activities, activity measurement for obvious reasons, but goes to show that not only the catalytic domain, but even from other regions of MTM1, the mutants heavily destabilize the phosphatase function. And this work was uh, very recently published in current research in structural biology. Thank you. Thank you, Tilna. Thank you for nicely uh, explaining this story. Uh, so Tilna talked about the molecular in protein, uh, pyrazine phosphatase. So uh, we heard about olfactor receptor, uh, hedgehog protein, tropomyosin, a PAZ, the phenylacetate uh, degradation pathway protein, and a myotibularin. And also got to see how sometimes a structural modeling receives the functional assay, or sometimes those experimental design demands of protein structure models to be built up and pursued in details, such as going till the molecular docking and several ligand binding studies as well. So uh, I would, I'd like to thank all the speakers today and uh, like to talk about the current positions, their current positions. So Dr. Srishti Batra, who talked about the insect olfactory receptor, is a co-founder and CTO at QZM's lab. Dr. Margaret Sunita, who talked about the tropomyosin structural modeling, is a researcher at Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts General Hospital. Nitish uh, Satyanarayan, who is a PhD student in CAPS lab, is a, also a co-founder and director of Ultra Nutri India Private Limited. And Dr. Dina Bhattacharya, who completed PhD in CAPS lab, is a postdoctoral fellow at Systems Biology in Ireland. Uh, I would also like to thank the instrumentation team for helping us in setting up uh, these sessions for the CAPS talk series, and as well as the CAPS talk score team. And I would now request Shafi to show the slides on the publication relevant to the today's session. Over to you, Shafi. Thanks, Advait. So uh, these are some of the references or publications relevant to today's talks. Uh, first, we heard from Shishri Patra regarding autoimmune receptors. And following to that, uh, Ma'am talked about hedgehog protein, which is Nehavia's work. And following to that, there are two papers from tropomyosins, and Margaret Sunida talked about them. And we heard from uh, Nitish about uh, PAZ protein in phenylacetate regulation pathway. And at the end, we heard from Tirna about myotubularin. Yeah, so for the next week uh, in CAPS talk, we have another set of interesting talks in function theme. Uh, we have titled it Computational Approaches for Enhanced Function Annotation. So please tune. Perfect. Thank you, Shabi. So we'll see. Um, I will request all the panelists to turn on the videos and we can see if there are any question and answers, open question and answers. I can see many of them have been, most of them have been answered online. So if any one of you in the audience has any question to ask, you can ask it now, raise your hand or post it in the QA box. Okay, in case there are no further questions, I thank audience as well for patiently listening and participating in the CAPS talk series and sincerely hope that you follow us every Thursday in this CAPS talk series. So see you all next Thursday. Thank you.